Hello, my name is Anne-Marie Kapinski and I'm from the Northeast Vascular Imaging Group in Albany, New York, and I'm going to present today how to do, read, and interpret the arterial duplex ultrasound examination. This next presentation, no, I don't want to say that. Let me start again. <laughs> This presentation will review the essential components of an arterial duplex ultrasound examination. We'll go through what uh, areas of the vascular tree need to be evaluated and diagnostic criteria and some of the common pathology that we'll encounter. When we talk about arterial testing and a patient presents to us, the first question we really are asking ourselves is, is arterial disease present? And this is a very simple yes or no answer to this question. And we can do this without using ultrasound technology. We can use an ABI or indirect testing to find out whether or not a patient has arterial disease. Very simple, very straightforward. Once we define the fact that there is disease present, then we want to go on to some sort of secondary modality and locate the level of disease as well as try to figure out the severity of disease. And duplex ultrasound is the, basically the best tool that we can do this uh, with for our patients and obviously being non-invasive. And we can get a pretty complete evaluation of what's going on. When we start off here, I put this slide in here to discuss power Doppler, which periodically you may see a slide or two, um, certainly, we can use it, we can get extended field of views such as this, where we can see the common femoral artery and then the bifurcation into the superficial femoral and profunda femoral. And color and power is a great tool and we can quickly go through the vascular system and look at what's going on. But when we suspect that there is pathology present or plaque, we have to remove that and evaluate that grayscale image in more detail. Now, what can arterial duplex ultrasound do? Well, we said we can identify the exact level of disease. That's the best thing we can tell. With that information, that can be used to direct the patient care. Is it somebody who can undergo medical management and just have uh, perhaps some lifestyle modification or, or perhaps treatment with certain drugs? Or is this a candidate that's best suited for an intervention or surgical bypass. An ultrasound can provide enough information to the clinician so that they can make these decisions. We certainly know that ultrasound can follow um, disease progression. We do this all the time with carotids. We do this as well in the lower extremity. One of the best things about ultrasound is that not only can we find the exact level of the anatomy involved, but we can differentiate stenosis from occlusion. This is not something we can do with physiologic uh, testing. We really can't define a almost occlusion from an occlusion with the indirect test, but we can with ultrasound. So we get anatomy and we get physiology, so it's a great combination of both tools. When patients come to our departments, they're going to have a variety of symptoms. It can be something relatively mild, such as claudication, or pain when they exercise, but then we can have more severe signs of ischemia such as rest pain or ulcers or gangrene. Then a lot of times we may be following patients for non-atherosclerotic problems such as a vascular trauma or iatrogenic injury. And of course we know that we follow patients post-surgery or post-intervention. The things that we can detect when we do arterial duplex, certainly it's atherosclerosis. That's the primary pathology that we see, hardening of the arteries. Another very common occurrence that will evaluate arteri uh, lower extremity arteries and even upper extremity arteries is for aneurysmal disease or pseudoaneurysms. We can also find dissections, intimal tears, arterial venous malformations or arterial venous fistulae. Fibromuscular dysplasia, or FMD, is less common in the periphery, although you can see it in larger vessels such as the iliacs. 
And a little less common than that even is evaluating patients for thromboemboli. This is usually an acute event. We don't often see them in the ultrasound departments, but they rather go straight on to an interventional suite. What areas do we look at? When we do the lower extremity arterial ultrasound, we pretty much start right about here, right at the groin crease, which is just below the inguinal ligament, and this is the common femoral artery. Now, depending upon what we see in the common femoral artery, we may want to extend the evaluation further north to include the iliac vessels as well as the aorta. Hopefully, if everything looks good here at the common femoral artery and our waveforms are acceptable and we can continue on down and just go on down distally and incorporate really the bulk of the lower extremity exam. Just down from the common femoral, we're going to include the profunda femoris or deep femoral artery. We don't really get to follow it for too long, but we'll examine it and as it's a major supply, to several large muscle segments in the limb. We'll scan through the entire length of the superficial femoral artery. Somewhere about the adductor canal, though, we'll, it will come deep and come up behind the legs. We'll have to change our approach. And then we'll scan the tibial level vessels. In terms of the tibial level vessels, if we look from an anterior approach, as this uh, limb here to the left of the screen shows, we can see the anterior tib coming out through the interosseous membrane, coursing along the lateral edge of the tibia, continuing down on the limb, down, 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 crossing the ankle joint, and at this point, it's called the dorsalis pedis artery. So we'll try to evaluate this entire length of this segment. On the flip side, if we look behind the limb, uh, this is a posterior view of the calf, we see the popliteal artery here, as we said earlier, it's going to be basically the continuation of the vessels after it's gone through the adductor canal. We can see here, here's our anterior tib coming off. This segment from here to here is termed the tibial perineal trunk, and its length is rather, uh, rather variable in individuals. Sometimes it can be very, very short. Sometimes it can be three or four centimeters in length. The posterior tibial artery comes out and courses medially, kind of near the tibia again, coming behind the ankle. The perineal artery, which also used to be called the fibular artery, is right on top of the fibula and deep in the calf and sometimes difficult to evaluate in some patients. In terms of looking at the upper extremity, large vessel upper extremity disease is pretty rare, probably less than five to 10 percent of our patients will be evaluated for disease, say, involving the subclavian axillary or brachial arteries up and through here. We see a lot more evaluation of the upper extremities nowadays prior to uh, use of the radial artery for cabbage or prior to the creation of an AV fistula, which we'll talk about that in a little bit. The protocol is not too complicated. Uh, when we're looking for plaque, we're going to use our workhorse transducer somewhere mid-range, 5 to 7 megahertz. A curved array is helpful, uh, particularly behind the knee, deep in uh, the lower thigh, or around the clavicle when we're evaluating those vessels. We're going to position the patient such that they externally rotate their leg at the hip and slightly flex their knee. Now, this may be difficult for some patients, and we may need to put some support pillow or blanket under the knee, uh, particularly if they have any type of arthritis in their hip joint. We're going to use a combination of color to guide us, B-mode imaging to identify plaques, and spectral Doppler to get our velocity criteria, and we'll go through all the segments that I just mentioned. We're going to sample again common femoral, profunda, proximal, mid, and distal SFA. Most folks choose to record in above knee and below knee portions of the popliteal as well as the, the three main tibial vessels and continuing down onto the foot with the dorsalis pedis. As I said, sometimes we are required to look at the aorta and the iliac vessels. In some labs, if the common femoral is okay, we don't have to include those more proximal segments. We usually begin the exam somewhere around this level, and some folks refer to this as the Mickey Mouse sign, 
where Mickey's face here is the common femoral vein, one ear is the common femoral artery, the other ear is the great saphenous vein. But this is about just below the inguinal ligament. This is the common femoral artery, and this is where we want to start our examination. Normally, arteries should be nice and smooth and thin-walled. We'll be able to appreciate the intimal medial boundary in many vessels. Obviously, as we get plaque, we're going to see the same changes we would expect to in any artery. We're going to see that, that plaque develop. We're going to see calcification, wall irregularities, and wall thickening occur in these patients. Here is a nice, normal, very healthy um, artery. We can see the walls are thin and smooth here. No evidence of plaque, companion vein here below it with the nice valve leaflets. Color is going to be our guide. It's going to be our tool. And we're going to use that to rapidly identify the course of a vessel. In this particular vessel, we see nice normal color filling out to the walls, continuing on through the superficial femoral artery here from the common femoral over here. If we look down this way, the profunda femoral artery or deep femoral artery is taking off. And we see good color filling there at the origin, although we're at a little bit different angle, so we're getting some color dropout and we'd probably want to angle back in a different direction to get better color filling in the profunda. But this is really about the only segment of the profunda we typically evaluate. Here's another image of a small tibial vessel where this is what we want to see. We want to see this beautiful color filling right up to the edges of the vessel. We don't want it to spill out into the tissue. But if we suspect anything, again, we have to turn the color off and look at the grayscale. Now, I mentioned briefly the intimal medial thickness, and I only mention it uh, in this application as some folks have chosen to measure it at the common femoral artery. You basically place a caliper at the interface between the vessel wall and the blood, and at the next bright interface, which is really delineating the media and adventitial boundary, and some folks feel that even in the absence of plaque, um, classic plaque as we would call it, when we see that this intimal medial thickness increase in patients, that that could be a marker for systemic atherosclerosis. And certainly the prevalence of coronary artery disease increases as the IMT increases. Now, let's get back to the main um, goal of arterial testing. Here in the lower extremity, we see a relatively nice, normal common femoral artery over at this end of the image. And scanning down, what do we see? Well, we see two things. We see the vessel is pretty significantly dilated, at least about twice the, the luminal size as it is up here. And we can see all this debris. Now, this could be some plaque. This could be laminated thrombus. Um, it really doesn't matter because it's there and it shouldn't be. And we need these type of images to define what's going on and that information then can be used to determine what's best for those patients. In this particular patient, we can see continuing on down into the common femoral artery, we don't really see any kind of narrowing in the flow channel, good filling out. So most of this disease is really not encompassing uh, any of the superficial femoral artery in this example, but it is uh, filling in along the back wall here and partially obstructing the profunda femoral artery in this particular patient. This is an examination of our classic, <clears throat> or I should say, this is an ultrasound image of our classic plaque that we would see during an arterial examination. Here's the plaque here. We can see some calcification and some acoustic shadow. Now, if we want a better evaluation of what's going on along the back wall, we're going to need to change our approach. We're going to need to scan in from this direction or perhaps from this direction. In this particular patient, there's two problems going on in that there's not only plaque in the artery, but there's some chronic thrombus here in the vein as well. Calcification, again, will produce the acoustic shadow behind it. Sometimes you see very fibrotic plaque, which will look bright white, but typically calcification will give you the shadow behind it. Here's a, a radial artery, which is showing some intermittent brightness in the vessel wall. 
maybe a little bit of acoustic shadow here and there. But if we have any doubt, what we'd want to do is take this vessel, go into a transverse scan, and then slightly compress with the transducer such that we can see whether or not it's compliant. Maybe there's some intermittent calcification. Maybe there's just some intermittent wall thickening. But if we can compress that artery um, with ultrasound probe pressure, then it's still a compliant vessel and we're okay. In terms of spectral Doppler, we need to follow all the rules we do for Doppler anywhere else in that we should maintain a 60 degree angle or less. Our sample gate should be placed in the center of the vessel so we collect center stream flow in terms of our Doppler data. And the Doppler beam should be aligned to be parallel to the vessel walls, not parallel to the flow jet, parallel to the walls. Um, there was a good paper published years ago by Bob Sissons who said that really the uh, significance between the two um, was, n there was not much of a clinical significance. We can always see the vessel wall and that's probably a better thing to shoot for, particularly since color is average data and there's a lot of helical flow and different flow patterns. So the color really isn't truly representing um, all the various components of the flow profile. So let's just align to the vessel wall and that'll be, that'll be our gold standard. Now, if we measure volume flow, which I'll talk about in a little later, um, we want to open our sample gate pretty wide. The measurements that most folks record really are peak systolic velocity and the velocity ratio. Some folks note the end diastolic velocity. It's not as important, uh, but some folks note it in the presence of disease because we'll see that end diastolic velocity change. The velocity ratio is simply calculated as the peak systolic velocity within the stenosis divided by the peak systolic velocity just proximal to the stenosis. And of course, as with any disease, we're going to document post-stenotic turbulence. Um, there is a wide range of blood flow and velocity in patients in the periphery. It's not like the brain where flow is auto-regulated. And there are varying levels of resistance depending upon the patient, their activity, if they've had coffee, if they're taking certain medicines, the vessel sizes differ, muscle and tissue mass differ, and all those come together and give us a pretty broad range. So an absolute velocity is not often used to define normal, um, but rather velocity ratios. Certainly as we see stenosis again, we'll get spectral broadening and we may see um, the post-stenotic turbulence with a true stenosis. This sketch is just thrown in here to, to remind us that as we go down the arterial tree, we change that very pulsatile flow into more continuous lower velocity flow so we can get good exchange at the capillaries. So velocities tend to drift down as we go out the vascular tree. Now in general, in peripheral arteries, velocity is less than 150 centimeters per second. Although again, you'll see very uh, broad range in velocities. Uh, a better value to pay attention to is the velocity ratio. Um, obviously it should be pretty much the same or certainly um, less than 2.1. As we get an increase in velocity that's doubled, we're con really consistent with a 50% stenosis. As our velocity ratio increases to 4 to 1, we're greater than a 75% stenosis. And this is a pretty classic uh, grading pattern that many people use. Now the waveforms we see on duplex ultrasound tell us a lot. Normally when uh, the systolic pulse is delivered to a vessel, that pressure makes the vessel expand slightly. We can see that on ultrasound. Um, in systole, the vessel expands a little bit. And as the vessel expands, that expanded segment of area actually holds a volume of blood flow. And during diastole, when pressures drop, the elastic recoil and the compliance of the vessel results in that vessel contracting back or recoiling back, and the vessel size decreases. And that volume of blood that was held out here gets propelled down the vascular tree. So when we see a blood uh, 
flow sample from a peripheral artery, we can see here that we have nice sharp upstroke and systole, a narrow peak, a rapid deceleration. This below the baseline is the reflected wave. That's the blood going down the vascular tree, hitting the high resistance arterioles, and getting kicked back or reflected back. And this integrated flow that we usually see in many patients is the result of that little bit of blood held out against the walls of the vessel. And when the vessel recoils in diastole, it sends that blood on down south. Now, we can see this nice, normal triphasic pattern in this example as well. Sharp upstroke, narrow peak, reflected wave, a little bit of antegrade flow at N diastole. However, even though this is nice and normal and our velocities here are within a normal range, they're like 71, if we look at the image, the image isn't normal. So we can't call this a normal vessel. We can see this bright white calcification here, a little bit of shadowing. So while the velocities are within normal limits, it's not a normal study and there's some evidence of very mild disease going on in the superficial femoral artery. Scanning on down, this happens to be the same patient at the popliteal artery, not much going on, maybe a little bit of plaque or a little bit of thickening here, and certainly normal velocities. So this is, again, normal velocities, but some subtle changes on the image, so we can't call it a normal study. Now, what if we don't see that triphasic pattern? What if we see a pattern that basically has one component? It doesn't cross the zero baseline. We just move forward in systole and there's no diastolic flow. Well, that's most often associated with observing a flow signal proximal to a high-grade stenosis or occlusion. Here we see flow, no flow, flow, no flow. And in this example, we're basically right at a stenosis but if we were just in front of it, we'd see the same example as well. Now, what about a low resistance monophasic pattern? Where again, we have no reverse flow component, just forward flow, but forward flow throughout the cardiac cycle. Well, that indicates that there's vasodilatation going on. Something has changed the resistance of that tissue bed. And we usually will see this if we're distal to a high-grade stenosis or occlusion. Let's look at this example. If we ignore the velocities here and just look at the waveform, that waveform is not normal for a peripheral artery. There's a lot of diastolic flow. We should never see that unless the patients just run up the stairs to get to our department or we've just run them on the treadmill, we'll see some diastolic flow. But the other thing to look at in this example is that upstroke that slope. And if we look here, the slope is kind of prolonged as compared to our normal example where the slope goes up pretty fast, pretty normal. Now color really is a complementary tool, but it certainly is an essential tool to get this done and do it quickly. We can put color on, we can find the vessels, follow the vessels along. The color will tell us if something's going on, if there's turbulent flow. And certainly color and power Doppler are going to be an adjunct that we can use to identify an occlusion versus near occlusion. In this example here of this bypass graft, we can see nice healthy color flow over here, nice and red, looking good. But as we go down the vessel here, well, what's going on? What's going on is that we're seeing a lot of aliasing. Something is impacting that signal. So what is that something? Well, that we take the color off and we look and we see that there's this major stenosis here. And whether this was a missed valve or hyperplasia or new plaque, it doesn't matter. We've identified it both on color and on grayscale, and it has to be fixed. When we're all done with an arterial duplex, we can create a sketch like this. If you want, plopping in all the numbers, it's going to be a matter of what your preference is for your departments. In terms of upper extremity duplex, as I said, a lot of it is going to be small vessel disease, vasospastic disease, which we won't do duplex for, but some of the applications of upper extremity duplex are listed here. Certainly a large one is 
the evaluation of the radial artery prior to harvest for cabbage. We can also evaluate the radial brachial arteries prior to the creation of a dialysis fistula. Um, we'll also be asked to evaluate those dialysis fistulas, which is a, a topic for another discussion. And although less commonly, we may even be asked to look at the internal mammary artery or IMA in folks prior to having a cabbage. Now the radial vessels are smaller and more superficial, so we're gonna to wanna to maximize our near field resolution and use a higher frequency transducer. For those patients perhaps getting a radial artery harvest, we're gonna look along the entire course of both the radial and ulnar arteries. We're gonna look for pathology, we're gonna measure the velocities and vessel diameter in those patients, and if you want, you can measure volume flow, although it's not too common. This slide here is showing that we can measure diameter well in either sagittal or transverse. Transverse is the textbook way to do it. And in this example, our variation, one measure to the other, this is 2.8 millimeters, this is 2.6 millimeters. Not very uh, different, certainly not gonna be clinically significant, however, if you're looking at things transversely, you know that you're not oblique to the vessel and perhaps have slid off a little bit and your measurements will thus be off in a sagittal approach if you're not careful. Now I mentioned volume flow earlier. Some folks do volume flow measurements and here we see an example of a radial artery and we've measured the volume flow. What we do is we dial in the diameter of the vessel, the machine calculates the area. Then we select cardiac cycles for the system to calculate the average velocity. We start here, we've ended here, we've included four cardiac cycles. We want to do as many as we can to get a good average. And in this, uh, with this equipment, it's fit this kind of aqua line here uh, through the curve, and it's calculated the mean velocity. So mean velocity times area gives us our volume flow. In radial arteries, most of the time the diameters are pretty small, two and a half to three millimeters. Uh, females are slightly smaller than males. Velocities have some variability, but are somewhere around 40 to 50. If we're looking at a patient that's undergoing perhaps a evaluation prior to a dialysis axis being created, We'll usually evaluate the brachial, radial, and ulnar arteries. We're going to do several diameters um, of each of these vessels. And in some way, we're going to evaluate the palmar arch for its patency and continuity, whether this be on ultrasound or physiologic testing. Most folks do some sort of adjunctive procedure to indirectly evaluate the palmar arch. As I said, IMA is not very common one little bit of information. If you can scan a vertebral, you can scan the IMA. Um, in this slide here, we see the ribs, and we can see the images right here. And we can see right below it, this flow channel, and that is the internal mammary artery. Just like we would expect to see the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae and the vertebral artery beneath them, this has the same appearance as that. The IMA is a high resistance bed, so we expect to have a high resistance signal. The vessels are small, only two to three millimeters. Not everything we look at is plaque, and we do evaluate uh, the arteries and find aneurysmal disease. The classic definition of an aneurysm is a 50% increase in the vessel size compared to the more proximal adjacent segment. So sometimes a smaller overall measurement may be more significant, particularly in a female that has smaller arteries to begin with. This common femoral artery is about 2.4 centimeters, so it's pretty big considering that most common femoral arteries are around a centimeter or less. So that's quite a significant increase and that is reflected of uh, aneurysmal disease. I put this signal in here to show that we really don't want to record a Doppler from within the dilated segment of an aneurysm because obviously the Doppler is disturbed because of this large saccular area. 
we've disturbed that laminar flow profile. Most of the aneurysms we see in peripheral arteries are popliteal artery aneurysms. They really account for about 70% of all aneurysmal disease. Most aneurysms are the result of atherosclerosis, although we can get aneurysms which form as a result of trauma or infection or vessel entrapment. Um, it's predominantly a male uh, disease, 30 to 1 odds uh, for uh, male presentation as compared to female presentation. And we know that aneurysmal disease is often bilateral and multilevel. So we'll look at, if we find a popliteal artery, we'll look at the other popliteal artery and maybe the common femorals and the iliacs and the aorta. The symptoms that patients present when they have peripheral aneurysms are going to be quite varied. Many may not have any symptoms at all. Some may have just some vague symptoms of pain. Some may have symptoms of venous compression where that aneurysm is pressing down on the vein, limiting the venous return and causing some edema and swelling. And sometimes the aneurysm actually will cause nerve compression and um, some pain as the result of the impingement on the nerve. The important thing when we talk about aneurysm is to make sure we document whether it's open or whether it's occluded. In this example, we see an old slide of a pretty large popliteal artery aneurysm. It's over four centimeters in diameter, but there is a residual lumen and there is flow coursing over and through all this laminated thrombus. So this presents a significant um, risk to the patient for venous throm or for thromboemboli to the digital vessels, um, mostly down, uh, resulting in something like a blue toe syndrome. Briefly, I'll just mention some of the iatrogenic injuries that we can encounter. Again, we see plaque, we see aneurysms, and we also see some other types of injuries to arteries. Pseudoaneurysms are a common occurrence. They happen after vessel catheterization. They're more common following an interventional procedure versus a diagnostic procedure because we are using larger bore catheters. And basically, it's a puncture site that fails to heal. We make a hole in the artery, uh, as shown over here. We should hold pressure on it, compress it, allow platelets to aggregate and a stable clot to form. But if we just don't hold long enough, what's going to happen? Well, it's not going to hold, and it's going to break, and we're going to see blood extravasating outside the artery and creating this false aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm encompassed by some of the connective tissue around the outside of the vessel. On ultrasound, we'll see a classic yin-yang kind of appearance to the color, this swirling appearance as the blood comes in, hits the dead end and swirls back out. Here is a longitudinal uh, scan of perhaps the common femoral artery. Here's the tear or the defect in the vessel wall resulting in the neck or the track into this large pseudoaneurysm sac. Now years ago, we could use ultrasound to help treat these patients and compress those sacs and get them the thrombos, but that was really a challenge both for the technologist and the patient. So now we primarily use thrombin injection where under ultrasound guidance a needle is placed, thrombin is injected, we will look and watch the thrombus occur within our eyes when we're all done, we see nothing. We see no color flow and a thrombose pseudoaneurysm. Another complication that can be observed following trauma or catheterization are arterial venous fistulas. Some AV fistulas may also be congenital, and it's basically an abnormal connection between an artery and a companion vein. And in order to determine whether or not we're really dealing with a fistula, you can always occur with, uh, decide what's going on by examining the contralateral limb and uh, comparing those signals bilaterally. Here we see a color flow image, this big brewy going on, a bit of the vein underneath it. We put the Doppler in there, and sure enough, there's this high velocity, low resistance Doppler signal that's uh, in this fistula from probably the superficial femoral artery to the either the femoral vein or common femoral vein. 
early on, a fistula is not that big of a deal. While it's taking blood and putting it into the venous circuit, it usually doesn't result in any other problems. However, if left untreated, some fistulas can get larger, resulting in an increased pressure in the venous system, which will blow out valves, and it can actually result in a distal arterial steal in some patients, so they need to be taken care of. As I said, if we look at signals right to left, we'll know if we're dealing with a fistula. Here is a Doppler waveform, but the spectral Doppler waveform on ultrasound would look similar. In the right limb here, this is a normal high-resistance multiphasic pattern. In the left limb here, this is indicative of low resistance, lots of diastolic flow, and in this case, that diastolic flow is going out through a fistula into the deep venous system of the leg. As I said, emboli and thrombi we don't often see. Emboli can arise from the heart or maybe from ulcerative plaque more proximally to the area that we're evaluating. However, because it's an acute event, we usually get pretty severe pain. Um, acute arterial ischemia results in the five Ps, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, and paralysis. There's some folks talk of a sixth P, poikiothermia, which means coolness. And this is so sudden and so acute, we usually don't get them over for an ultrasound, but we bring them in to the interventional suite for an embolectomy. If we see them on ultrasound, though, the adjacent vessel here is free of disease. Nice, normal-looking artery and just this big uh, thromboemboli sitting here with a little bit of color flow around it. Dissections, um, again, briefly, dissections can be observed in peripheral arteries. We want to look at it from multiple views. We want to make sure we're not seeing an artifact. We'll see color and Doppler in both the true and false lumen of a dissection. A harder thing to evaluate are these small defects, such as an intimal tear or flap. Sometimes people may dislocate a knee or an elbow, and we're asked to evaluate the adjacent vessels making sure there was not a traumatic injury to the artery. We need to really zoom up on the vessel wall, pay attention to the grayscale, because that's how we're going to see these very subtle defects. And then sometimes we get arterial problems that really have no name. Um, this was a patient who just had this slow, oozy kind of bleed out the brachial artery. It wasn't a pseudoaneurysm. It wasn't encompassed anyway. It was just extravascular blood flow that we knew shouldn't be there, but it really wasn't um, a named pathology, such as a pseudoaneurysm. So to conclude, duplex ultrasound can provide the exact information we need on the location and severity of disease. We certainly can identify plaque, but in addition, we can identify traumatic or iatrogenic injuries as well. And the wonderful thing about ultrasound is we not only get this anatomy, but we get excellent physiologic data as well. So we get anatomy and physiology for a complete picture of what's going on in these peripheral arteries. Thank you very much.